On the 6th of June, at 9pm local time, as a Qantaslink Boeing 717 turns onto final for runway 30 at Hobart International Airport in Tasmania, Australia, a perfectly routine flight begins to unravel. First, the captain starts to notice a chlorine odour. It feels like it's coming from the flight deck gasper vents. The first officer notices shortly after, but the odour disappears after about 10 seconds. The pilots continue their approach and begin configuring the aircraft to land. But 30 seconds later, the captain starts displaying some worrying symptoms. His vision is affected, while his mental capacity is reduced and he barely retains the ability to even move. He hands over the controls to his first officer. He looks over to the captain who looks pale, but not quite incapacitated. The aircraft is descending through 3200 feet and the captain says he can assist the first officer as pilot monitoring. He correctly actions the FO's request to lower the flaps and the landing gear, but trips over his words when trying to read the checklist. He's prompted to call the first officer stable through 1000 feet and stumbles through but manages to correctly respond to all radio calls. Monitoring the welfare of his captain, the FO considers using emergency oxygen himself, but decides against it as the odour has become undetectable. He's most concerned with the captain's condition and needs to ensure he doesn't inadvertently make contact with the flight controls. He considers making a pan call, but decides it's unnecessary due to the immediacy of landing. Just get the plane on the ground, he probably thinks. Through 100 feet, however, the first officer starts experiencing some symptoms himself. He can't quite keep aligned with the runway center line. The aircraft is drifting right and it takes longer than usual for the pilot to correct for it, as he also starts to feel hazy. The mild symptoms aren't communicated to the captain, but the aircraft lands safely at 21.13 local time. The 717 taxis to the gate and the flight crew are assessed by a company doctor. The captain's speech is noticeably affected and he's taken to hospital for further testing, while the first officer reports a dull headache which will last the next two days. So what in the world has gone on here? What should have been a completely normal approach and landing slowly unraveled into one which was genuinely high risk. What caused the pilots to feel so unwell? Was it some sort of mass hysteria? Or could they have even been the subject of some sort of biochemical attack? Well, all of what we've talked about so far is not only one of the hot topics in the aviation industry, but the subject of fierce debate and research. So let's recount the story of Qantas Flight 1541 from the beginning and uncover some facts about aviation fume events. At 7.43pm local time, a Qantas Link branded Boeing 717-200, operated by National Jet Systems and with flight number Qantas 1541, takes off from Sydney Kingsford Smith International Airport. On board are 54 passengers with three cabin crew and two pilots. The aircraft is registered VH November X-Ray Mike and is part of Qantas's aging Boeing 717 fleet. In fact, it's one of the last 717s left operating in the world, with just three airlines left flying them. The 717 has proved to be a reliable and appealing aircraft over the years, but it's a type reaching the end of its lifespan after production was stopped in 2006. As QJet 1541 climbs to its cruise altitude of 34,000 feet, the pilots receive a call from the cabin crew. They've noticed a smell at the front of the aircraft. It's unnoticed by the pilots, but they say it's a strong, chlorine-like odour. At 
As the flight becomes established in the cruise, the captain seeks some further information. The two cabin crew members at the front of the aircraft report feeling pressure in the head, a metallic taste and dizziness, but that the odour has now passed and the symptoms aren't increasing. None of the passengers have seemed to notice it or appear to be experiencing any discomfort. The two cabin crew members assess themselves as fit to fly and the captain elects to continue the flight to Hobart. What he believes the flight attendants have experienced is a cabin air quality event, a general term covering most unusual smells one could experience in an aircraft cabin environment. They're generally considered typical of indoor environments and safe, but they can range from a stinky meal to oil leaking into the air path. Other CAQ event causes identified by the ATSB include dirty water separated bags or contaminants in the aircon system, which is provided air by the engines. Cleaning, de-icing or other chemicals introduced into the air path can cause CAQs as well while fumes and pollution from the external environment or from within the cabin or cargo hold can also be the culprit. The thing with CAQ events is, the specific cause is very rarely identified. On VH November X-Ray Mike, multiple cabin air quality events have been reported in the last week. On the 1st of June, a rotten garbage smell was noticed by forward and aft cabin crew members on the application of takeoff thrust it lasted just five minutes. Maintenance actions included the replacement of coalescer bags where water collects in the air conditioning system and a running of the auxiliary power unit. Over the next two days, in which the aircraft flew five times, no issues were reported until the 4th of June when a chlorine smell was reported at both forward and aft galleys and the flight deck. The cabin crew experienced mild symptoms dizziness and shaking, so the flight was diverted to Sydney. But on the ground, a systems inspection found no signs of any leaks or the source of the fumes. A ground functional check was carried out, but no odours were detected, so the aircraft was deemed serviceable. No further issues were reported over the next 48 hours. The problem with an aircraft producing unknown odours is drawing the line on when they start to become hazardous, or in other words, when they become fumes. The ATSB doesn't provide a definition of a fume in the report I'm referring to for this video, but I consider a fume to be an odour which has the potential to cause incapacitation. We'll come back to this definition later. When a fume occurs, a pilot response should be automatic. They're required to don oxygen thus removing the risk of becoming incapacitated. But it becomes more complicated when the line between a fume and a CAQ event becomes blurred. To use the procedures at National Jet Systems as an example, an extract of which is provided in the ATSB report, it advises flight crew to don oxygen in the event of smoke, fire or fumes in the flight deck. It's a procedure detailed in the Quick Reference Handbook. Following the donning of oxygen, the checklist directs crew to descend to 9,000 feet and remove the fumes by depressurizing the cabin. However, it also advises that this procedure would be inappropriate for dealing with CAQ events, likely because they're so common and theoretically don't pose a threat to the safety of flight. In the past 12 months, 28 CAQ events have been recorded across the Boeing 717 fleet, all of which were categorised as innocuous. So we have two types of events and two corresponding actions, but how do pilots differentiate between the two? What's the difference between a fume and a CAQ event? Well, National Jet Systems stated that it's down to pilot judgement of the hazard. It's up to the judgement of the pilots whether they risk incapacitation and the safety of the flight, or they potentially apply a procedure which the company deems could be inappropriate. This is the hole which was uncovered in the ATSB report, and about fumes in general, in my opinion. Let's play the accident sequence again to discover why. The Boeing 717 turns onto Final in Hobart. 
the captain notices a chlorine-like odour. The FO notices shortly after, and it disappears after about 10 seconds. Neither crew experiences any physical symptoms. They likely judge the smell in the same way they did earlier in the flight, as a CAQ event. However, a fume, which has the potential to cause incapacitation, can be perceived to disappear after a short period of time. It's 30 seconds later that the captain begins quickly developing adverse symptoms, with his vision, mental capacity, and movement all affected. Three signs that the smell is more than just a CAQ. While he assesses himself as fit to fly as pilot monitoring, the captain's judgement is likely affected by the fume. The ATSB identified that the National Jet Systems Pilot Incapacitation Training did not include identification and response to subtle incapacitation. It's likely why he doesn't opt to don oxygen. The very pilot judgement which the standard operating procedures rely on to define a fume has been hamstrung and the first officer is affected as well, but it's not until 100 feet that he begins feeling symptoms. He elected not to don oxygen after initially not experiencing any negative symptoms before the smell went away. He continues the landing despite feeling hazy, taking longer than usual to react to the aircraft drifting off centerline, believing it to be the safest course of action rather than going around. The aircraft lands safely but with several safety issues evident. The ATSB focused on the National Jet System's standard operating procedures. Their cabin air quality event procedure focused on the reporting of odors, post-flight care and maintenance actions, but it didn't link to or even consider the risk of fumes or pilot incapacitation. At NJS, the default judgement of smells in the cabin was to consider it a CAQ event. All 28 reported events in the previous 12 months were recorded as CAQs, despite some of them even involving physical symptoms. There was just no guidance on when to upgrade the judgement to a fume. It was simply all placed on the crew, whose capacity to make an assessment could be affected by the very fume itself, as we saw on Qantas 1541. We've been focused sharply on the procedures of Qantas's national jet systems, but fume events are an issue in aviation worldwide. In November 2017, the crew of an A320 on climb began feeling nauseous and dizzy after taxiing behind a Cessna Citation, with symptoms becoming progressively worse until they donned oxygen in the cruise. A British Aerospace 146 on a series of flights in Sweden had cabin crew members feeling like they were moonwalking and the pilots donning oxygen after suddenly becoming nauseous. The crew of an A320 which departed Zurich provided an exemplar response to fume events, first experiencing a sweaty sock smell for 30 seconds as they climbed through 10,000 feet. They discussed their options and decided they would don oxygen and declare a pan if the smell returned. It did return on descent and the flight landed safely at London Heathrow. The specific cause of all these events was not identified, but they show the advantage of having clear guidance and therefore a clear mental model. When an aircraft depressurizes, whether explosive, sudden or gradual, Pilots know intuitively to don oxygen immediately. It could be seconds before they become incapacitated with hypoxia, so it's ingrained into them to get onto oxygen. It's this level of clarity that's needed for fume events, as we saw with Qantas 1541. The onset of the effects of fumes can be gradual, and incapacitation can be subtle. So, a fume should be defined as a smell which has any physical effects. As soon as they start occurring, pilots should don oxygen. This clear guidance is my pilot takeaway from this incident, and I believe it should be incorporated into SOPs and regulations to give crews a clear trigger on when to upgrade a cabin air quality event from a smell to a fume. A threat which has the potential to incapacitate and affect the safety of flight. 
fume events are a current hole in the aviation safety system. We've seen how they can create high risk events like on Qantas 1541. So reform like this is required to keep aviation safety on an upward trajectory.